As we continue our explanation of uh, the great lines of poetry by the Imam from these days and times, from the area of, of currently in the southern part of Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia, which is the area known as Jizan or Jazan, where there's another little village in that area called Samita, who was raised there, the great Imam al Hafiz of Al-Hakami, rahimahullah, which is a scholar from our days and times, who is the scholar of all other scholars currently known today, from the great Imam of these days, such as the great Imam Ahmad Najmi, rahimahullah, who died not too long ago, and also a Sheikh Zaid, the great Imam, rahimahullah, and also who are still living, who is also from the students of al Hafal al-Hakami, such as a Sheikh Ali Nasir al-Faqihi, who is also still living, rahimahullah, wa hafidhahullah wa ra'ah, and also from the students that benefited from al Hafal al-Hakami is also the great Al-Alama, Hamilu Liwa al-Jarh al ta'dir bil haq Rabi' ibn Hadi al-Madkhali, rahim hafidhahullah wa ra'ah, and the list goes on and on of the numerous scholars who came from the, or under the tarbiya, or the cultivation of that great scholar who died young, as al Hafiz al-Hakami died in his 30s. And I think, what comes to my mind, I think he died at the age of 35. And he was a great scholar and he was highly intelligent and he was known for his, his quick wits and strong memory. And to the religion, in which his, his family and his parents were kind from the, as they say, from the Badia, but he used to spend their time in agriculture and in the farmlands. And that's where he originated from, the great Imam al Hafal al Hakimi. As we'll have time to get inside the history of this great Imam, which in itself will probably be lessons. But he is from the scholars of today, where he was assigned from Allah to be with Ta'ala, from those who Allah gave talents and gifts for memorizing and understanding very quickly. Like I said, you'll find that he authored in every fen, in every science of the religion, poetry and beneficial books, which to this day, the students of knowledge utilize those books to benefit and enlighten and teach the people the affairs of their religion and educating them, utilizing his books, Rahimallah, Rahmatun Wasi'ah. And like we said, it's, it's it's really amazing of what he accomplished in a short period of time, even though he died at the age, like I said, or it died in his 30s. And like I said, I think what comes to my mind, he died at the age of 35. Rahimahullah. As we continue with the lines of the poetry, by this great Imam, if everyone looks in their books, we were discussing the affairs when he brought the lines of poetry, discussing how the month of Ramadan is an obligation which has been established in our religion by the ayat and the authentic narrations as a duty that has been binding upon every Muslim woman, uh, every Muslim male and female. As you'll find that the great Imam, he goes on his poetry, he says, صيام شهر رمضان حتما بالآي والحديث فرضا علما وهو على من تجب الصلاة على وهو على من تجب الصلاة وعليه إذ جاءت بذا الآيات واستثني من ذا من يكن معذورا شرعا ويأتي حكمهم مذكورا وهو لهذا الدين ركن رابع وكم له قد صح فضل ساطيع We said in the lines of poetry as we've discussed last class that the month of Ramadan just to go over briefly before we Start the new lines of poetry. You'll find that he said, Rahimullah, the month of Ramadan is hatm, is an obligation by the Book of Allah. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in his book, in Surah Al Baqarah, that everyone is familiar with. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, kutiba alaykum as siyamu, kama kutiba ala ladina man kablikum la alaykum tatakum. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that clear, as we already covered. 
that, O you who believe, that fasting has been prescribed and an obligation upon you, just as it was prescribed from those before you, so you can attain piety, and hope that you will attain piety. So that is from the Book of Allah and the authentic Sunnah, as we know, which comes in the authentic narration of the narration of the narration what we know as the narration of Jibril, the Hadith Jibril, that came to the Messenger of Allah, asking him what is Islam and Iman and Ihsan, as we know. Inshallah, bi idin Jalla wa Az. Where Jibril asked him what is Islam, where he expl- and the Messenger of Allah gave the answer by the open actions. What the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Al-A'mal al zahira which is the testification that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, and to establish the salah, and pay those alms to the needy, and to the poor, and to fast the month of Ramadan. So the Messenger of Allah made that a pillar, to establish the salah, which is the fourth pillar. If you notice in the narration of Jibreel, that fasting the month of Ramadan is a fourth pillar as the great Imam Al-Hafid Al-Hakami that he mentioned in the poetry. That he mentioned that and said, وَهُوَ لِهَذَا الدِّينُ رُكْنٌ رَابِعُ وَكَمْ لَهُ قَدْ صَحَّ فَضُلٌ سَاطِعُ He said in the poetry, Rahimallah, he said it is a fourth pillar of the religion. And how many virtues has it been authenticated about this pillar? So, as we mentioned it said, the affairs of what is pertaining to fasting, which is as we know in the shara, we'll talk about the definition of it. As we said that it is refraining or abstaining or the meaning of siyam linguistically just means abstination, abstination to refrain from doing something. As far as in the book of Allah and in the sunnah, it is imsaakun mam fi zaman al من شخص مخصوص عن أشياء مخصوصة معنية تلاندما. As everyone, we know that the meaning as far as in the Book of Allah, in the authentic Sunnah of our Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام, that the meaning of siyam is refraining, or or a specific abstination, and in a specific time frame, from a specific person, abstaining from specific things, with the intention. With that place originating within the heart, which is the intention. And we know the specific time frame is from the time the sun starts to come up when one hears the second of then. But we know we do not hear the second of then here in the non Muslim lands. But the second of then, or the second fajr, as they say, the second fajr, which is the true fajr, is just merely the, the meaning of is the time for fajr. And that's it. Is the time for Fajr. <clears throat> so that time frame is when the time of Fajr, for the, meaning the prayer of Fajr, when it comes in to when the sun sets, which is the time for Salat al Maghrib. As we discussed last class, as far as the specific person where this type of worship is valid, it is only from a Muslim, a one who's entered the fold of Islam. He's in his and he's saying he's in him or her is in their right state of mind. And the one who is not binding upon, even though they might have these prerequisites fulfilled, is a woman that is on her mints and a woman that is on her postnatal bleeding after her pregnancy. For those affairs in which all these, like we said, details will come in within the lessons that we will give out of preparation for this blessed month, which we ask Allah to be with Ta'ala. To allow us to see and reach another month of Ramadan Where that will be a tremendous blessing If Allah allows us to see it And may Allah Tabri with Ta'ala allows us to, allow us to reach it And not only reach it But but asking him Subhanahu Jalla Fil Ula To bless us in it by giving us tawfiq Giving us success To establish all the affairs of worship In a manner that pleases him So it could be accepted And we'll be from those who truly benefited from that blessed month, bi idni la jalu az. We already discussed <clears throat> that we said that the specific things that being on guard against, where the true fast is abstaining from from ignorant or inappropriate speech while one is fasting, and that is the true fasting in which only those 
who Allah gives tawfiq have truly benefited from that month or from their fast. So it's not merely just abstaining from food and drink and that's it and different types of pleasures that one will indulge in with their with their wife or their spouse and that's it. Rather, the true test is abstaining from unlawful speech and all types of obscenities or all types of profanity or un anything unacceptable to say while one is in that state. For that true affair is only from those who are from the Sadiqeen, who are truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where they gather between not from only those affairs that they abstain from as far, as far as nutrition in regards to food and drink and the likes, but in addition to that is abstaining from all accept, unacceptable behaviors, whether, whether it be exhibited verbally or physically and the likes of that. So it's not just fasting. From the nutrition or the tangible things that one gives nutrients to the body by, but also exhibiting an exemplary character and maintaining that while one is fasting, because that's also from the great lofty goals of fasting that one attains piety by, which is to abstain from, like we said, unacceptable uh, speech or obscene, or if you want to say unacceptable behavior in all of its different various types. So verily, the month of Ramadan, like we said, it was an affair that became obligatory during the time of the Hijrah or after the Hijrah. When the message of Allah migrated to Al-Madina, which was the second year after he migrated. After the second year, after the migration to Al-Madina. As we talked about, في السنة الثانية من الهجرة في شهر شعبان. As the message of Allah, alayhi salatu wassalam, that he fasted. Nine months of Ramadan. Nine months of Ramadan. Alayhi salatu wassalam. What was known in regards to what he had did. Alayhi salatu wassalam. He, he fasted nine months of Ramadan. Meaning those different years. Those different years he fasted nine months. And we talked about how the process started in regards to how fasting became of what we see currently. Number one, it started with the obligation of fasting Yom Ashura, the day of Yom Ashura, which is, a, which is from Muharram. The month of Muharram on the Hijri calendar, there's a month called Muharram. Muharram has in it specific days where Musa, Prophet Musa used to fast. And those days, as we know, is the day of Ashura. In the beginning of the revelation, when the Prophet Sallallahu first started receiving it, receiving the revelation in regards to fasting, Fasting the day of Yom Ashura was obligatory. That was the first stage. Then that was abrogated. And then fasting became, fasting became, of course, in the month of Ramadan. But it was still in a manner where it was, one could do it by choice. If he wanted to fast, he could. And if he did not want to fast, he could leave it. Then, then, or in, at the same time, fasting started from Isha. It started from Al Isha. All the way up to the next night, the following day after Maghrib. That was another tadarraj, that was another stage or phase. In which fasting passed by, of course, which was one to fast starting from Al Isha to Maghrib the following day. And with the condition that one could not sleep after Maghrib. If he fell asleep, then everything will become unlawful upon him or her until the next day. So, one could not sleep after Maghrib. If they went to sleep after Maghrib, they could not eat, they could not drink, they could not uh, be intimate with their spouse until the following day after Maghrib. So, if one stayed awake, they could eat and drink all the way up to Al Isha. And after Al Isha, then one will start their fast again. All the way up to the following day, which is the time of Al Maghrib. And that was what the gradual process was until the affair became, in which we see today, currently, in which we now fast, which is starting from the time of Fajr to the time of Maghrib when the sun sets, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated all those affairs and bestowed His mercy upon the Ummah. 
giving them those affairs that will make, make the fasting easy for them and raise and raising the hardship and difficulties of this ummah. In which those ayats which Allah to with Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, which we'll talk about later, but just to say it quickly, and what we'll mention in which the great Imam Sheikh Zaid mentioned about this, this affair, I'll mention it again. But anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشروهن وبتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتم الصيام إلى الليل The Allah تبرى وتعالى says in his book علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم he said that Allah Taala knows that, that of what taken place between those who fell into being intimate with their spouse after Al Isha, or after the time where they were supposed to start their fast again, or those who fell into falling asleep, and then they still woke up and indulged inside of some of those affairs that they were not supposed to, even though they be, it became haram upon them. When they fell asleep and they woke up, it was incumbent upon them to start fasting again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't relieve them. He gave them the relief where it says, Your Lord indeed knows that you used to what? Tahtanun. He said that you were indulging in those affairs you shouldn't be doing. He said, Kuntum tahtanun for now it says in the ayah, Kuntum tahtanuna anfusakum. Fataba alaikum. He accepted your toba and he pardoned you. Then Allah changed it. To what we see how fasting is today. As you'll find that the great Imam Sheikh Zayd ibn Hadi al Madkhali, Rahimallah, Rahmatu Asiyah, that he mentioned and said, He said, Before the obligation of Ramadan, he said, Kana mafrudu, so ma yomi ashura, haythu inna nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lamma qadim al Madinata, sa mahu, wa amra nas bi siyameh. فلما فرض رمضان كان هو الفريضة وترك عشرة فمن شاء صامه ومن شاء تركه. He said before the obligation of the blessed month of Ramadan, he said what was incumbent upon everyone was to fast the day of عشرة. For verily the Messenger of Allah when he came to Al Madina, he fasted the month, uh, excuse me, the day of عشرة, and he commanded the people to fast that day. He said, فَلَمَّا فُرِضَ رَمَضَانُ كَانَ هُوَ الْفَرِيضَةِ وَتُرِكَ عَشُرَةِ He said, for verily when Ramadan became an obligation, that was the duty that was binding upon the people to carry out. And the day of Ashura was left. Then it became in a manner in which one had the choice. Whoever wanted to fast, they could fast. And whoever wanted to leave it, they could leave it. He says, كَمَا رَوَى مَالِكٌ وَالشَّيْخَانِ وَغَيْرُهُمَا عَنْ عَائِشَةَ أُمِّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا أَنَّهَا قَالَتْ كَانَ يَوْمَ عَشُرَى يَوْمًا تَصُومُهُ قُرَيْشٌ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَصُومُهُ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ فَلَمَّا قَدِمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ الْمَدِينَةِ صَامَهُ وَأَمْرَ النَّاسِ بِصِيَامِهِ فَلَمَّا فُرِضَ رَمَضَانُ كَانَ هُوَ الْفَرِيضَةُ وَتُرِكَ يَوْمَ عَشُورًا فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَمَنْ شَاءَ صَامَهُ وَمَنْ شَاءَ تَرَكَهُ تَرَنَّفَ He said just as Imam Malik he narrated in his book entitled Mubatta and the Shaykhan and there's two and there two authentic books which is Bukhari and Muslim and other than them upon our mother Aisha رضي الله عنها that he said that she said the day of Ashura was the day that Quraysh used to fast before Islam. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast, fast it likewise, before the revelation, of course. He said, for when he arrived to Al-Madinah, he fasted that day and he commanded the people to do so. He said, when the obligation of Ramadan came to practice, that was the obligation. And the day of Ashura was left. And the people, if they wanted, they could fast. And if they will, if they will, they could fast. And if not, then they could leave it off. So that was the other gradual stage or the other phase that the Muslims were upon until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed his mercy upon us by making the fast of what we see currently today. 
So you'll find that the great Imam, as we discussed last class, we also mentioned in regards to what fasting and who it is binding upon to do it. We talked about what the great Imam al Hafid al Hakam he said his poetry. He said that fasting is binding upon who the person who's supposed to pray. It's an obligation of those who pray. And we know that the little children that are under age who have reached not that age of puberty, that one could do it out of tamreen, to have them acclimated or to get them habitually accustomed to fasting if it's not a hardship against them. And if they're able to them to be busy by giving some type of toy, and if you want to allow them to fast, to have them busy with some type of, like we said, of recreation or some type of toy to keep them busy so they do not think about food and drink out of trying to have them acclimated to this tremendous worship. But it's not binding until they reach the age of puberty. Once they reach the age of puberty, then, like we said, they fall under the category where the obligation becomes binding. We talked about how fasting for all the conditions have to be fulfilled. Number one is one has to be Muslim. Number two, one has to be sane. They have to be in a right state of mind. al -aqam. They have to be in a right state of mind and they have to be what? They have to fall under having sanity. It cannot be, as they say, majnoon. A person that's in a state of insane or insanity, excuse me. And what we just mentioned a moment ago, that one has to reach the stage of puberty. <clears throat> and those affairs become binding once they reach that age. We also talked about the affair of having the ability. We said that last class, which is called the Qudra al sawm where one has the ability to fast. For it's not an obligation, as we'll discuss, as like we said, it's going to come upon the one who's sick, nor the one who's traveling, nor upon the elderly, who is very elderly in age, and they cannot withstand fasting. Nor is it upon the, the woman who's pregnant, nor breastfeeding, if harm will reach them or reach the child for that difficulty because of fasting, they do not have to what? Fast. And you'll find that these are the, the beauty of our religion, how everything is organized in a, in a very organized, systematic fashion. For everyone who's a non-Muslim that looks at these affairs can see how the religion is perfectly, perfectly planned out, how it's been perfectly what? Organized and strategic of Taking consideration who's can fast and those who cannot, which is easy for a person who has has their insight opened by law to now realize that this affair of fasting and this obligation has now what has been nothing except revelation from the Lord from above the heavens. Right. So if you notice in the poetry, he said, "Wahu ala man tajibu salatu, alayhi ilja tabida ayatu." He said. And it's for those who are excused from fasting. He says, well, It's that the ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned in his book, which is the sort of Baqarah also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَمُ مِسْكِينَ he said, for those who find it a, a burden or a hardship or a tremendous difficulty, he said, then they pay the ransom of feeding a poor person. And all those details are going to come, inshallah. But we already just discussed the lines of poetry. We said, He said, Give the exception for those who are excused by the kitab and sunnah, which we already mentioned, such as the one who's, who's sick and the one who's traveling and the one or the woman who's pregnant, breastfeeding, the elderly and the woman who's on her mints and her postnatal bleeding. Like I said, take into consideration everything is in its proper place and systematic and everything has been what? Laid out in detail to know how to do it properly. And nothing like we said can be, or none of these, the systematic, perfect affairs could be except from one who's all intelligent, one who's complete in his characteristics, who is, all, who is Allah, our Lord, Tabarakah wa ta'ala. 
So as we go on the poetry, let's go over again quickly. So let's skip down to the fadail. As we already mentioned, the fadail or the the uh, the virtues of this regard in regards to fasting. As it says in this poetry, وَكَمْ لَهُ قَصَّحَ فَضْلٌ سَاطِعُ تُفَتَّحُ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَانِ إِنْ دَخَلْ شَهْرُ الصِّيَامِ وَالشَّيَاطِينِ تُغَلْ شَهْرٌ بِهِ تُفَتَّحُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَتُغَلَّقُ الْأَبْوَابُ مِنْ جَهَنَّمَا شَهْرٌ بِصَوْمِهِ الذُّنُوبُ تُغْفَرُ وَتُعْتَقُ الرِّقَابُ النَّصٌ يُؤْثَرُ خُلُوفُ فِي الصَّائِمِ دُونَ شَكِّ تَفْضُلُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ رِيحَ الْمِسْكِ وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَنَّةِ لِلسُّوَامِ بَابَ لَهُ الرَّيَّانُ إِسْمٌ سَامِي To the end of it. Then as we already covered the different virtues of fasting. We already discussed this. We'll just, like I said, we'll go through it quickly because we already mentioned the narrations explaining each line. He said, well, how many tremendous virtues that comes in regards to giving and enlighten us about this tremendous month? He said, during that month, the gates of paradise are open. During the month of Ramadan and the Shayateen are chained. As we talked about last class, we said we gave three important details. Number one is that the Shayateen are upon the non believers or the disbelievers in the month of Ramadan all throughout this month and outside the month of Ramadan, meaning throughout the year. The devils are always upon the non believers and the disbelievers. Or those who are upon another way. The devils are pushing them to do evil daily. And that's to answer a question. Because one might. Or one. A thought process might come in one's mind. Why is it that month of Ramadan starts. And evil still. Is taking place. Why is evil happening and transpiring. In front of us even though the month of Ramadan started. That's because like we know. And you'll find that Ahl Ilm answer all these questions. And they say, due to the fact that even though the month of Ramadan has started, the devils are upon them in the month of Ramadan and outside the month of Ramadan. And those who are from the Odiyah of the Shayateen, whether they be from the people, from the disbelievers, or even be from those who are upon a deviated way from the people of innovations. For example, such as the Khawarij. You'll find if you look in the history of the Khawarij, they used to do majority of their evil during the month of Ramadan. They used to do the majority of their killing and their mass hysteria and, and evil pillage of, of killing innocent bystanders. They would do their mischief and they would perform it during the month of Ramadan. So a person would say, this is evil. How can it take place in Ramadan even though the devils are chained up? That's because the, sh- the Khawarij are from the Odiyat, the Shayateen, due to the fact that the Messenger of Allah gave the description of them being from the dogs of the hellfire. So you'll find that those from the people of, the, of Bid'ah, especially those who are upon a, a severe, warped, corrupt ideology in their belief, you'll find that we said that even the Shayateen pushed them to do evil during that blessed month. So you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in this book, Alam Tara Anna Arsadna Shayateen Al Kafirin Ta Uzzuhum Azza. Do you not see that we sent the devils upon the disbelievers pushing them to do evil? So that's in regards <coughs> to the, the disbelievers and even certain of those sects from the people of Bid'ah. who indulge in those type of matters, especially during the month in which you'll find that evil still emanates from them, even though the month has started. So that's one detail that one might ask themselves, why is it that we still see evil transpiring during the month of Ramadan, despite the fact despite the fact that the Shayateen have been chained? That's one answer, that's one detail. The second detail you'll find that Ahl Ilm given this regard of why evil still takes place during this blessed month, even though the Shayateen are still chained, you'll find that it says in another explanation that the Prophet Sallallahu said it in authentic narration. He said, الجن. He said that the shayateen are chained and the rebellious. He said the shayateen are chained. And it says in the narration, given more details, it says الجن, The rebellious devils or the major devils. So he said, so one explanation or a second saying in regards to why we see evil. He said, due to the fact that the major devils 
are chained, but they're still minor ones, still causing mischief. They're still causing mischief. So the minor, the major ones do not necessitate that the minor ones are still uh, causing temptation and uh, stirring up evil in certain people and certain people, uh, certain people who are not observing the fast properly, even though they might be Muslim, but you still see them committing evil. So that's that's another regard. Another third excuse or third uh, explanation that they say in regards to the meaning of that the devils are chained. They say that the devils are still around, but due to the fact of those who truly uh, comply with fearing Allah during that month, they would be busy with so much good to the point where the shayateen would not be able to tempt them at all of how they would tempt them out the month of Ramadan. Due to the, the abundance of good they, they indulge in or they're in of, of devotion and, and so many different various acts of worship, meaning during the day of fasting and during the night of praying and all the various types of good that they're putting forth to the point where the shayateen are not able to tempt them at all due to the abundance of good they're performing. So, so as they say, So where the shayateen are not able to have power over them as he will have power over them outside the month of Ramadan. And they say that's another reason why we see evil during this bus month is due to these all these key factors that we just mentioned, all these details. So, You'll find that al in that they gave those explanations to clarify why we still see evil taking place during the month of Ramadan, even though these narrations says clearly and states clearly what everyone that the shayateen are chained and they are shackled during this month. So it says in the poetry, so shahru bihi tafattahu abuab sama abuabu min jahannama. He said that the gates of paradise are open. And we know the narration said that the gates of paradise are open to the point where there's no door locked from the gates of paradise. And all the gates of hell are locked until there's no gate that is open from the gates of hell, meaning all of them are shut. And we know that it is the month in which the sins are forgiven. And we talked about last week that the sins that are forgiven is the minor ones. Not necessarily the major sins. The major sins from its prerequisites is that it has to, one has to make toba, that one has to make toba repentance for the kabair for the major sins, and that's due to the hadith which is in the Sahihain upon as we said last class. Remember, I said everyone that the majority of, of the narrations, rather a lot of the narrations of Siyam, all comes under the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, the great Sahabi. Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr al Dusi, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa arda. The hadith of Abu Huraira, which is also in the Sahihain, when the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam, that he mentioned and said, He says, Ramadan ila Ramadan, O Salatun ila Salah, O Ramadan ila Ramadan, O Hajjun ila Hajj, O Umratun ila Umrah, Mukafiratun, O Mukafiratun lima baina hun, Ida Jutuni batil kabair. As the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam that he said, wa Ramadan ila Ramadan, wa Jumu'a ila Jumu'a, wa Umra ila Umra, kafaratun lima baynahun. He said, alayhi salatu was salam, that one Ramadan to another Ramadan, and one Salah to another Salah, and one Jumu'a to another Jumu'a. All those affairs are means for one's sins being remitted of what is between them. As long as they abstain from the major ones. So all that is to show clearly that what the major sins, one has to fulfill the prerequisites of a proper repentance, which is that they have to stop doing it, doing the act immediately to stop doing the act. And they have to refrain from doing it, as we mentioned, and they have to do it and and abstaining from it. And they have to also have that remorse and regret 
of what had transpired, what had emanated of that evil that they have committed, they have to feel that severe remorse and regret. And all these affairs that will lead them to falling into it, that they should stay away from it. Well, all those affairs of proper repentance needs to be fulfilled if it is from the major sins. But he goes on to say that the minor ones will be forgiven. So the month of Ramadan to another month of Ramadan is a means for one to attain their sins being removed and being remitted if they're from the minor ones from last year to, till now, as long as they avoid the major ones. And also the people's necks from the hellfire are liberated. Of what comes in the text where the great Imam al Havan al-Hagami says, He says, and the necks are liberated from the hellfire during this month as it comes in the authentic narrations. He says, And from the fada'il of the bounties of that tremendous month is that one's breath changing while he's in the state of fasting without any doubt. He said that it is with Allah, virtuous, similar to what is the, the fragrance of musk. So that one's breath while they're fasting, we know that it changes where it's not as pleasant. And it changes to the point where with Allah, it becomes similar to the fragrance of musk. So that's one f virtue as we are accustomed to knowing yearly, as we heard this type of what? This type of virtue. And also from the virtues is in paradise, there is that door, which is only for those who will fast, in which the message of Allah had said that the name of the door is ar -Rayyan. And it's a ismun sami. It's a, it's a lofty name in which Allah Taala has described and has revealed to our Prophet والسلام, that those who fast will enter it, and once they enter it, they will drink and they will never become thirsty ever again. And also, what has been narrated, if you look in the poetry, and that is narrated, our Prophet said about our Lord. That fasting is for me and I will repay by it. Meaning that Allah has made the reward of fast, fasting tremendous. Tremendous even though all the other deeds that Allah has multiplied, multiplied by so many different folds other than fasting. As fasting can be whatever Allah wants to give as a reward for it. For it says in the narration as we know, is that Allah Taala said in Al Hadith Al Qudsi, and Al Hadith Al Qudsi meaning is a narration that that the Messenger of Allah narrated upon his Lord, and its meaning and its wording both, and its meaning and its wording both. So that's the meaning of Al Hadith Al Qudsi. So it says. <clears throat> That Allah Taala says about that fasting that I will reward by in al hasnatu bi ashri amthaliha ila sabi mi'ati daif. That every good deed is by what multiplied to ten folds, all the up to seventy hundred folds, ila sabi mi'a daif, all the up to seven hundred folds. That's tremendous. From one reward being multiplied from ten all the way to seven hundred, depending on what type of act it is. And depending on how much one is devoted and, and their focus in it and their concentration in it, where their minds will become preoccupied by something else, where their thought process uh, turns their or, or renders their attention to something else, and they have that ikhlas, that sincerity in it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can what? Can now multiply the reward until it reaches this extent or reaches this degree. However, fasting is, is above that. From ten folds all to seven hundred folds, however, fasting is greater than that. Due to the sincerity that Allah Taala will give as a reward for the servant fasting, because fasting, no one truly knows it except Allah. As anyone can fake is that they're fasting. But however, the reward is so great for fasting due to the fact of the sincerity that one displays while he's fasting. In which Allah says it clearly. He said that fasting is for me. Meaning that Allah is saying that he's the only one that truly knows who is fasting. Because how many people when their heads are turned, they can, they can easily conceal. Breaking their fast by going to all the different uh, uh, types of nutrients or food that 
is easily tangible in front of them. And they could easily break their fast and no one would know. But however, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that based upon the, the, the genuine niyyah or the sincerity, that he will still fear his Lord by ob observing that fast until he's supposed to break it. And as a result of it, due to that great sincerity that he maintained throughout the fast, that Allah will prepare for him or her that tremendous reward, which is greater than the 10 multiplied folds, all the way up to 700. That the fasting is greater than that. And that one can enter paradise as a result of fasting if they have not done anything to now render it incomplete or render it uh, invalid as a result of them not being uh, excused from the Kitab and Sunnah, but just doing it out of following their desires. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to protect our fast in this blessed month that is approaching. So then he goes on to say in the poetry, he says, As it's been authenticated for the one fasting, two rejoicements, when they break the fast and when they meet Allah on the day of resurrection. He said, and other than that, how many virtues can we, be, we count? And how many warnings have come in the Kitab al Sunnah for one not fasting? And we'll talk about that throughout the lesson as it's going to come, inshallah. Right, so let's go on in the next poetry. As he says in his poetry, now, look what the great Imam al Hafiz al Hakim goes on to say Thubutuhu biru yatil hilali, wahithu igma'un fabil ikmali, the iddati shahbani thalathina wafi, huruji hil amru kadaka fa'rifi. وخوفي شهادة الهلال على ثلاثة من الأقوال فقيل لا بد من العدلين في الصوم والفطر كلا الحالين وقيل في دخوله عدل وفي خروجه عدلان شطان تفي وقيل يكفي العدل في الفطر كما في رؤية الصوم لما قد علما من كونه قصح في الدين العمل بخبر الواحد من غير جدل. He goes on to say in his poetry ثبوته برؤية الهلال he said that fasting inaugurates by the sighting of the moon, by the crescent moon. And if it becomes if it becomes obscured, meaning that something is hindering you from seeing that, then it then one completing the idda to Sha'ban. Then them completing the period of days or the of Sha'ban, which is thirty. And similar to that, one does the same thing when the month is over. Likewise, he says, know that. Then he goes on to say, وَالْخُلْفُ فِي شَهَادَةِ الْهِلَالِ عَلَى ثَلَاثَةٍ مِنَ الْأَقْوَالِ He said, however, they differ in regards to the shahada. The one coming and testifying that they seen the moon. The, tes the testimony of one seeing the moon or the sighting of the moon. He said, of three Statements that was from the ulama. He said, Faqila, it was said that one has to have two upright Muslim witnesses when the month starts and when the month is over, meaning in both what? In both circumstances. He said, The second, so just to sum it up, so one statement. Or one position is for the month of Ramadan, one has to have two upright Muslim testimonies. When the month starts and when they cite the moon for when it's over or when it's concluded. The second statement, وَقِيلَ فِي دُخُولِهِ عَدْلٌ وَفِي وَفِي And they say the second in regards to when the month starts, that it suffices one testimony. One testimony of an upright Muslim who has that strong vision, they know have that strong vision and they know how to seek out the sighting of the moon for the month of Ramadan. So just to sum it up, the second statement, just to make everything easy, that it just one just needs one witness. One witness, one upright Muslim witness or testimony of one upright Muslim. Who knows what they're looking for, of course, and their vision is strong, and they are very accustomed to those matters of what they're looking for. So, when a month comes in, the second statement is one, and when it departs, 
it should be two. It should be two upright witnesses that see the sighting when the month is concluded. So that's the second statement of Ahl Ilm. The third statement, they say, It said that it suffices one testimony of an upright Muslim when the month is over and also for the signing of the moon when the month starts. So they're here in the third aqwal or the th- third statement of the ulama is that one witness suffices for when the month starts and one witness suffices for when the month is concluded. And then he says of the great imam, we'll talk about this and discuss this right now, inshallah. But he goes, I'm just translating the plans of poetry. He said, من كونه قصح في الدين العمل بخبر الواحد من غير جدل He said, due to the fact it's been authenticated in the religion that we, we can work with the narration or the news that's been conveyed by one individual without any dis- without any disputing this affair has been established in our religion which they call qabuli khabar al-wahid accepting the news or the narration of it being conveyed through one individual so it goes on to say ثُبُوتُهُ بِرُؤْيَةِ الْهِلَالِ وَحَيْذُ إِغْمَاءٌ فَبِالْإِكْمَالِ So let's go back to the first lines of the poetry. He says that the month of Ramadan that is established by sighting the moon, the crescent moon. By sighting the crescent moon. And if it's something hindering your vision of that, then completing the 30 days of Sha'ban. So the, month of Ramadan, so the month of Ramadan has been established by the sighting of that crescent moon, like we said, which has been authenticated in our narr- in the narrations of our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. You'll find <coughs> that one, of course, during the days of Shawwal, but that's when the month is over. Let's go back to uh, Sha'ban. But just the number one, just to start the narrations. With the message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, as it comes in the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar, which has also been narrated in the Imam, Imam Malik in his, in his book called Al Muwatta by the great Imam Malik ibn Anas. Malik ibn Anas ibn Malik al Usbuhi, the great Imam, Imam Dal Hijra, that he wrote in his book called Al Muwatta. He brought the narration of Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anhuma, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قال الشهر تسع وعشرون فلا تصوموا حتى تروا الهلا فلا تصوموا حتى تروا الهلا ولا تفطروا حتى تروه فإن هم عليكم فقدروا له He said that the message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said that the month is 29 days What does he mean by 29 days? Meaning what is considered a month the least is 29 Meaning that After the 29th day Then go seek out Go seek out the what? The moon Or the, the, the sighting of the moon for, To see whether or not The following month has started So he said that's the That's the least Of what's considered a month Which is 29 So if You do not sight the moon Then count 30 days And then start the new what? Start the new month So that's the meaning of the hadith so the Prophet ﷺ said, the month is 29 days. Meaning that's considered the month of, of the least amount of time, 29. And do not fast until you see the crescent moon. And do not break it until you see it. And if it becomes obscure or something hindering your vision, then count 30 days. Then count 30 days. So the sighting of basically the message of Allah is giving the time in which one starts looking for the moon which is after the 29th night start looking and if you don't see it or something is blocking your vision or hindering it then count 30 as it comes clearly in the narration and also the message of Allah gave instructions where he said in another narrations we are familiar with he said, fast, to, fast due to seeing 
the sighting of the moon and fat and break your fast mean conclude the month by seeing it also if it becomes obscure where you cannot see it or something is blocking your vision due to clouds or raining or due to the storm or might be a storm or what have you then count 30 days if you see alhamdulillah how our religion is just so perfectly planned out and everything everything has been perfectly planned out with clear instructions of how to see it how to start it if the vision has been hindered if something is blocking it what to do all these affairs are to show how our religion is the truth that everything has been given strict clear instructions and details for anyone who studies the these affairs with this type of insight will draw up the conclusion that this religion could not been revealed except one who is perfect and the one who's all wise and all knowing of what he legislates to better with the Allah. But at any rate, that was just a side benefit. And that is in regards to now, which we'll talk about when one comes to convey it. When they inform us that the month has started, how do we deal with it? So that's the next instructions. If some con- someone comes telling us the month has started, is this, does it suffice the testimony of one or is it two? Or does it have to be a group of people or what have you? He said, that's what we'll speak about now to explain the line of poetry where he said, where he said, Rahimahullah, the great Imam al Havan Hakimi, he said, Well, Khulfu. في شهادة الهلال على ثلاثة من الأقوال. He said they differ in regards to the testimony of who seen the sighting. Upon three from the statements of the ulama, the positions that were mentioned. He said the first position, Sheikh Zaid ibn Hadi al Madkhali, rahimahullah, that he said, وهو الراجح الاكتفاء بشهادة رجل مسلم على دخول رمضان لما روى عكرمة عند ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال جاء أعرابي إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إني رأيت الهلال يعني رمضان فقال أتشهد أن لا إله إلا الله قال نعم قال أتشهد أن محمد رسول الله قال نعم قال يا بلال يا بلال أذن في الناس فليصوموا غدا The first position which is the strongest opinion and which is the Al-Qawr Rajih, which is the strongest opinion, is that one can suffice, or what is adequate is the testimony of one Muslim man of course that is upright was upright in his testimony one Muslim man, given his testimony that he's seen the sighting of the moon, suffices from when the month starts due to the narration that comes in the authority of Ikrimah Upon Ibn Abbas, they said that the Bedouin came to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and he said he's seen it. For in Ramadan, he said, do you testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, Ya Bilal, announce to the people to let them start, them, let them start their fast tomorrow, meaning the month of Ramadan. You also have a narration similar to that in Sunnah Abi Dawood in Hadith Hamad ibn Salama upon Simak ibn Harb an Ikrima also. And the meaning came, and the meaning is correct, even though the Isnad might have a little weakness in it. But the meaning, no, no doubt, is correct due to the supporting narration that we just mentioned. He said that the Messenger of Allah commanded Bilal, and they announced amongst the people, and Yaqumu wa and Yasumu, based upon that one. Narration or news that was conveyed from that one individual, it was announced that the people to start their fast the following day. So I asked him and to establish the obligation of accepting the testimony of one upright Muslim. Of course, if we know he's trustworthy and reliable, and they know what to see and they have the proper qualifications of what to know. Of how to see the sighting of the moon for the, for the inauguration of the blessed month of Ramadan. طيب. Based upon that, what we just mentioned, he said that once the moon has been sighted, it says the obligation of song or the obligation of fasting starts. This was a position of Imam Ahmed saying that it suffices for the month of Ramadan for one upright Muslim to testify to that affair. 
and also the Imam al-Shafi'i and one of his two statements وَبِهِ قَالَ إِبْنُ Mubarak. and also this is the position of the great Imam Abdullah the great Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and also the Imam al-Nawi and they say it is al-Asah that is the most authentic position that suffices that one upright Muslim testifies and that when the month is concluded it is a stipulation of the testification of two upright Muslims two upright Muslims that go out to seek the sighting of the moon in the conclusion of the month of Ramadan he said that that is the statement of the Jamhur from the Fuqaha and the people of Hadith and we'll talk about the position in regards to Abu Thawr the great Imam and Abu Bakr bin Mundir and what they say and they're going to talk about that shortly in their position but the second position the second position is that one has to have two they have to have two witnesses from when the month starts and when it's concluded two witnesses Due to the fact that the position that they take here, they don't distinguish between the Sabah Shahada for the Khuri wal Khuruj. They don't make any differentiation between what is considered the acceptance of the testimony of when the month starts or when it what? When it is concluded, when it's over. It says should have two. And there are narrations that they bring to support this fact. Some of the fuqaha, such as Al Imam Malik, said these are great imma who say this, take this position, such as an Imam Malik, and also the great Imam Layth ibn Sa'd al-Misri, and also the great Imam al-Awza'i, Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al-Awza'i, and the great Imam, who's also a Jabal, who's a mountain, who's an Imam al-Thawri, who's Shafi'i. And one of their two statements, وكذلك al-Hadawiyya, all use narrations. They use narrations in the authentic Sunnah, which is in al-Nasai and the Sunan. You'll find there's a narration upon, upon Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd ibn al-Khattab أنه خطب في اليوم الذي شك فيه فقال ألا إني جالست أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وسألتهم وإنهم حدثوني أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال سوموا لرؤيته وأفطروا لرؤيته وانسكوا لها فإن هم عليكم فأتموا ثلاثين يوما فإن شهد شاهدان عدل شاهدان مسلمان عفوا شاهدان مسلمان فصوموا وأفطروا حديث صحيح. There's a narration it was said on the uh, on the authority of عبد الرحمن بن زيد بن الخطاب that the message of Allah exhorted the people. He gave a speech. He said which there was no doubt in. He said, Verily, I sat with the companions of the Messenger of Allah, and I asked them concerning this affair. And they informed me that the and they gave me a hadith. He said that the Messenger of Allah said, Sumu di ru'yatihi. Fast when you see it, break your fast when you see the sighting of the moon. He says, and start your when start start your nusuk, meaning your rights of of your, your secret rights, meaning your aspects of worship, meaning worship. Start it upon that. Meaning upon you seeing it. And also concluded upon you seeing it. He said, if you're obscured or hindered from seeing it, then complete the 30 days. That's not the point of reference in the hadith. The point of reference in the hadith is here. Where it says, if two witnesses, Muslim witnesses see it, then fast. Meaning to start the month. And when it's concluded, when you have two Muslim witnesses, then stop it and conclude the month. So you find that they're using... You find that they're using what everyone? They're using narrations. Type. So that's one narration. There's another narration where it says, when the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said in the narration, there's also been Abu Dawood and Dar Qutni, An Amir Mecca, Al Hadith ibn Hatib. Amir of Mecca, Al Hadith ibn Hatib. Hadith ibn Hatib. That is said in a narration, but the Messenger of Allah also said in another one, فَإِن شَهِدَ شَاهِدًا مُسْلِمًا وَقَرَ فِي الثَّانِي وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدًا عَدْلٍ This particular narration says, if two upright Muslims give their testimony that they've seen the month, then start. 
So how do we answer this? So what we these two narrations, if you if you ponder on it, what you will understand, because there's a reason why I'm saying this. What you want to understand, the mafhum, the understanding is that there has to be two witnesses. And they call that from the qawaid of fiqh, they call that dalalatul mafhum. By the, what was indicated or what one understands from the narration. So that's what you call dalalatul mafhum. That's what you would call dalalatul mafhum. وحديث عكرمة وحديث ابن عمر You'll find that the narrations that we set upon عكرمة and the hadith of ابن عمر that indicates the acceptance of one testimony of an individual from one man who's Muslim and upright if they give the testimony then it's accepted that's the narrations of the first position that we gave That was the position of the first narration that we gave, uh, the first position we gave. So how do we gather between all these narrations? Just to sum it up, what do we do to gather between all these narrations? You'll find there's a qaida fiqhia, there's a qaida in fiqh, there's a principle in the affairs of jurisprudence in fiqh, that they say, if you have narrations that are have what they call of which you extract a particular understanding of, based upon dalalatul mafhum, based upon what you will understand, then you have a narration what they call dalalatul mantuq, the indication of what the Messenger of Allah said. He said what takes precedence is dalalatul mantuq, the dalal or the indication of what was said by the Messenger of Allah takes precedence of what one will understand of another narration. Because the Dalalatul the Mantuq, what the Messenger of Allah said, is something that is what? Clear. And that would take precedence because it's strong. Because the Messenger of Allah remove what? Any doubt by his direct statement. So that's what he said, say in regards to answering the second position. That okay, the Messenger of Allah said two. That could be utilized, of course, no doubt. But it does not negate that just sufficing by one is also an affair that's not considered. It's also an affair that is what? Considered. Because that is what the message of Allah directly said. So in both cases that what? Both can be utilized, whether it be the first position or the second. But what the message of Allah gave as as it, it being adequate is that it only suffices for one. And that's by Dalalatul Mantuq. That's by the indication of what was said by the message of Allah. Then you have the third position, or what was the position of Abu Thawr and Abu Bakr ibn al-Munzir. That they say that one has a position of, it suffices by one for when it starts and one when it's over. And that's the third position of what was mentioned by them. Rahimahullah. Rahmatu I'll just read it quickly and then we'll conclude the lesson. And we'll continue tomorrow. He said the third position with the great Imam, Sheikh Zayd ibn Hadi al-Madkhali, Rahimahullah that he said, وَقِيلَ إِنَّهُ يَكْفِي فِي ثُبُوتِ الرُّؤْيَةِ وَمِنْ ثَمَّ وَمِنْ ثَمَّ الصَّوْمُ وَالْفِطْرُ شَهَادَةُ عَدْلٍ وَاحِدٍ وَهَذَا الْقَوْلُ مَنْسُوبٌ إِلَىٰ أَبِي ثَوْرِ وَقَدْ اعْتَمَدَ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ يَعْمَلُ بِخَبْرِ الْوَاحِدِ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَحْكَامِ كَرُؤْيَةِ هِلَالِ رَمَضَانِ وَكَقِصَّةِ الرَّجُلِ الَّذِي صَلَّى صَلَاةَ الْعَصْرِ مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قِبَلَ الْكَعْبَةِ ثم خرج فمر على أهل مسجد وهم راكعون متجهين إلى بيت المقدس فقال أشهد بالله لقد صليت مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل الكعبة فداروا كما هم قبل البيت وغير ذلك من الأحكام التي تثبت بشهادة الواحد والعمر بخبر الواحد لا ينكره أحد ولا يجادل فيه إلا أن أبا ثور في هذه المسألة خالف كافة العلماء وترك أدلتهم الصريحة في اشتراط عدلين يشهدان برؤية هلال شواق كما رأيت وإلى هذا الخلاف أشار الناظم بقوله 
So this is the third position, but we already just said that the first position was the strongest. But just to mention it quickly as an extra benefit, it said that what suffices in regards to seeing the sighting of the moon is just one for when it's sighted, for when the month, uh, when the month of Ramadan starts, and one suffices when it's concluded. That's a third position. And to this was the position of the great Imam Abu Thawr. You shall find that he relied and depended on this particular statement by utilizing the narration of one individual con conveying it, which comes in so many places in the authentic sunnah of the message of Allah. From them is what we just already said. The sighting of the moon of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar and the Bedouin who came to the Messenger of Allah informing him that he sighted the moon. He said also the, the story of from the great affairs of worship, such as the Salah, where the Messenger of Allah, or excuse me, where the companions of the Messenger of Allah changed the direction of their prayer while they were praying. For example, he says in the story, he said there was a man, he said, الرجل, the man who prayed Salat al Asr. He prayed Salat al Asr with the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam towards the direction of the Kaaba. He said, then he left and he passed by people at the masjid and they were making ruku'. He said they were bowing. However, he said that they were they were towards the direction of Beit al Maqdis, which is in Palestine. So the affair pertaining to the Kaaba didn't reach them yet. Of, of them supposed to pray towards the direction of the Kaaba did not reach them yet, because we know what the first part of the revelation they used to pray facing Beit al Maqdis. Beit al Maqdis we used to pray for the Salah or towards the Masjid al Aqsa, which is in Palestine. So he said, Faqala, he, he, he said to them, and he, ca he called out alone while they were praying. They were praying the Salat. He said, I testified indeed, I prayed with the Messenger of Allah towards the direction of the Kaaba. He said, when they said that, they turned in their prayer towards the direction of the Kaaba. So you'll find that Abu Thawd used this as a as an evidence to say that it suffices for one in the beginning and one in the end. And nobody rejects the affair of accepting the news of one trustworthy narrator. That's nothing that's disputed in. That's from our religion. So however, Abu Thawd, that he opposed the majority of the ulama and left off the adilla that is frank in this regard by that when the month is concluded, that one shall have two witnesses when the month is concluded. But it's not in prerequisite in regards to the month starting. And we'll talk about another qaida fiqhiyah. There's another qaida principle in fiqh that one that we'll mention inshallah next class. But just to conclude this affair, we just said that that was the meaning of the poetry in which the great al-Hafid al-Hakimi that he mentioned. Talking about how we start our month by the sighting of the moon of how it's done. Either when the 29th day, when we reach it, then one starts to seek out the sighting of the moon. And if it has not been sighted or they did not see it in that particular night, in that particular night, which is the 29th, they didn't see it. Then they would just count the days, concluding the 30. Or if, like we said, if their vision has was obstructed due to some hindrance, due to the clouds or what have you, or the different circumstances there are that might hinder the vision. Then they will also count the 30 days of what will now be concluded definitely without the month, uh, uh, definitely with the month being over. And then they will start their fast after that period of time. And that will stop here, inshallah. And we'll continue tomorrow. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk